All right, guys. So today is Friday, July 23rd. Um, and made it to the end of the, our first React week. So hopefully you guys are getting more and more comfortable with, with React. Um, today, we're actually gonna talk about something <clears throat> that's a little outside of React. And we're gonna be talking about asynchronous JavaScript, uh, kind of just uh, some uh, background on it. And more specifically, the highlight of today is working with promises and understanding the JavaScript fetch API. So you're gonna be using this fetch API a lot um, for web development. So again, we're gonna focus a lot of time on it today. And then we'll cover uh, new site three. So continuing on our new site project. So a lot to get through today. So let's kind of just dive right into it. <clears throat> All right, so um, a lot of topics as mentioned. So let's get started with asynchronous JavaScript. Um, so the four topics in this uh, part of lecture, um, asynchronous JavaScript, I will say off, off um, up front, that this isn't vital to kind of know um, or understand fully. I just think it's a good background to understand kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so don't, you know, don't worry too much about uh, if you kind of get lost in this discussion. Um, we'll move on to JavaScript promises after that. This is very important to kind of understand. Also, it is very, I wouldn't say very complicated, but it, it does take a while, I think, to understand promises. At least it took me a while to kind of just fully understand how promises work. So uh, make sure you kind of read up on documentation after our lecture um, and get comfortable with promises. We're gonna do a quick HTTP review. Um, so we cover this, I think, during our HTML week. Um, but let's go over that again, because um, it's kind of important to know about uh, when you're using the fetch API. So um, JavaScript has a fetch API that makes it quite convenient to kind of um, make requests out on the web. So we're going to talk about that, um, see a few examples, and kind of just get comfortable with using fetch also. All right, so again, a lot of topics today. Let's get started with asynchronous JavaScript. So um, first, we want to define what it means to be synchronous. And this is kind of the confusing part. So the English definition, or like, you know, the language definition for synchronous is existing or occurring at the same time. Um, so that's the definition of it. Um, I guess the problem here is that synchronous code isn't quite what you would expect it to be. So uh, when we talk about synchronous code, um, that means code statements are going to be executed or completed in order. Um, so not really at the same time. So again, the, the word synchronous means occurring at the same time. Um, synchronous code, on their hand, is a little different. Again, it's a little confusing for me. I'm not sure why the wording it is as it is, but basically, um, synchronous code will be executed in order line by line. So it's guaranteed that you can complete line one before you complete line two. All right, um, then on the other hand, we have something called asynchronous code. So this is where code statements aren't always completed in order. So there's no guarantee of necessarily what order they'll be completed in. So we've mentioned this with React before. Again, if you recall, I think from a couple of days ago, we talked about how we update state in React and how the updating states is an asynchronous operation. So um, again, if you kind of um, recall when we did that example of we set state on a particular value and then did like a console log of that value right after the set state called, and we saw that the value at that point in time was not actually updated. So you know we call the function that we thought would update it right away, then we printed the value, but the value was not printed. Do you guys all remember that from uh, our React examples? <clears throat> um, but yeah, so that's again, that's an example of asynchronous code. The set state, um, there's no guarantee of when it's going to finish, but it will complete at some point, and then um, we can react to that uh, once the update has gone through. All right, so that's asynchronous code. There's no guarantee of the execution order or the completion order of the statements. <clears throat> Any questions about synchronous code versus asynchronous code here? All right, well, let's continue. All right, so synchronous code, um, as mentioned, waits for the previous statement to fully complete. So again, if you have lines A, B, and C, A is gonna complete fully, then B is gonna complete, and whatever C needs to do will complete. Asynchronous code um, doesn't always need to wait for the previous execution. So again, if you have three lines of code, A, B, and C, A might take a long time to complete, but B and C might um, complete before A completes. And then A might complete after B, B and C kind of resolve their task. So asynchronous code generally 
means faster execution because if you have independent items um, that need to be done, they can be done in parallel instead of one waiting for the other to complete. Does that make sense? <clears throat> All right, so what we've done up to this point has mostly been synchronous code where we just go line by line, assume everything uh, completes before the next line um, executes. But we're gonna be talking more about asynchronous code, um, especially with the Fetch API. All right, so let's, let's do a quick example here. Um, I'm gonna do a few tasks um, kind of on screen. Uh, they're not really that, that glorious, but I'm gonna do something, uh, do a few tasks synchronously. So I have a task list that I created here. Um, first task is what was the first breakfast cereal produced? So I'm gonna go do that task quickly. If you guys don't mind, uh, looks like my browser is not up. Where'd you go browser? Oh, there it is. All right, so what was the first, first breakfast? Corn flakes. I like corn flakes. Cereal produced. Um, let's see. So 10 oldest cereals, so breakfast cereals, let's see what Wikipedia says. Um, first. So it says here we have something called granula, uh, not the same as granola, it was invented in 1863. So I think that confirm, uh, aligns with what this uh, article is saying. So seems like granula was the first cereal. I've never hate, had it. I, I doubt it's still produced uh, today, but it'd be interesting to try it if it can be found anywhere. Um, all right, so that was my first task. I uh, just looked up that. Uh, let's get to my next task. Um, what is the population of zebras in the world? All right, uh, seems I actually don't know the answer, so I, I am learning with you guys. Uh, what is the population of zebras in the world? Any guesses before I look it up? At least three. At least three, two. Um, all right. So according to Nicola.org, it says around 750,000. So under under a million zebras, I guess. I don't know if that's surprising or not, but um, I don't think they're endangered, but you know, that's on the low end. I would have guessed more actually, um, honestly, kind of guessing at it, but okay. So that's zebras. And one more item on my task list. So let's see what it is. Uh, what is the capital of Swaziland? Uh, I've heard of this country. I don't know the capital. So what is the capital of Swaziland? Okay. Um, apparently it's also called a swan team. I did not know that. Uh, I don't know if they renamed it or it's just two different names. Uh, looks like they actually have two capitals. I don't quite know how two capitals works, but I guess they have two capitals. I didn't even know that's possible for a country. But okay, so that was my task list. So I did those in order. Um, I did them synchronously. Um, so nothing too, too crazy going on there, but that's just a, a sample of like, imagine just a code, um, some application, you know, executing lines and kind of finding this information synchronously. But let's actually change it up here. So I wanna do something asynchronously now. And for this, I'm actually gonna request uh, for a couple of helpers. So any couple of volunteers? Don't worry, it's not gonna be coding related. Sure, got it. Alex, is that what you volunteering? Yeah. Okay, we got Alex. We need one more person. I can do it. All right, was that done? All right, cool. So you guys are going to help me complete my tasks here, and we're going to do this asynchronously. So first task I'm going to give to Alex Saunders. Your task is going to be, uh, when it comes up, uh, just look it up. When you're ready to give a result, just say done, and then um, I'll ask you for the answer when I'm ready. All right. So Alex, your task is going to be, how many total calories are there in an entire box of Love Crunch cereal? So they come in 10 ounce sizes, they're kind of small. Um, so do your research there and then let me know when you have a result. Um, meanwhile, Don, your question is gonna be, what animal has a longer lifespan, an armadillo or a zebra? And then I have a test. So Don, when you're ready for an answer, just say you're ready. And then my test can be, what's the distance between Swaziland and Switzerland? So I'm gonna go do my test while others are working. So Swaziland and Switzerland distance. I'm ready. All right. Um, so it looks like it's about 13,000 kilometers by train. I don't know, direct distance, maybe direct. Apparently Swaziland was renamed 
yeah, I guess I'm not up, up with the times, but okay. So direct line distance looks like it's 85 or uh, 100 kilometers. So it's about 5,200 miles. All right, good to know. Um, okay, cool. So Don, you said you're ready. Could I get the answer from you? Yeah, the zebras live longer. Okay. Uh, do you happen to know how, how long each of them lives? I do, but that wasn't part of the question. That's fair enough. 12 to 15 for armadillos, 25 for zebras. All right, good to know. So zebras live longer. I found the distance between Switzerland and Swaziland. Uh, we're waiting on Alex. Oh, I was already done. Okay, well, can we get the answer? Yeah, 150 calories. Okay, so I believe 150 is per serving though, right? You might be muted there. Um, but yeah, so it's 150 oh. per serving. And then I think each box is like four servings, six servings, something. Um, we'll, we'll take 150. So it's 150 calories. Oh, yeah, it is. So it'd be, I'm sorry. So it'd be 1500 because it's 10 servings per container. Okay. Yep. Okay. So I guess there's 10 servings. So one ounce servings. All right. Thanks, Alex. So again, that was an example of us doing it asynchronously. These three tasks were not dependent on each other. So I was able to kind of like farm it out to, I guess, my helpers there. So uh, with, um, some applications, they can be multi-threaded. So when we talk about multi-threaded, that just means you can spawn off worker threads to kind of do other tasks for you. So in this case, if I was like the main execution of a program, I spawned off two other threads. One was given to Alex um, and Alex looked up uh, the answer to how many total calories on their box of Love Crunch. Um, again, this was meant to be a longer task. So while he was looking up his, um, I guess his information, Don was able to proceed with his and then I was able to proceed with my with my uh, task, I guess, here. So again, the, the end summary is it took less time than it would have just taken me to do all three tasks because I would do it myself and do it in order. But in this case, these three are totally independent. So I was able to break it up asynchronously so that we had fast, faster execution and still got the same result. All right. Hopefully that, that kind of made sense. Again, asynchronously, if you can do things kind of um, separately, but in parallel, um, generally, you get faster execution with your application. The downside is managing asynchronous code is a little more tough um, than dealing with synchronous code, but um, it's nothing too crazy. All right, any questions again about synchronous code or asynchronous um, code execution? All right, so let's continue then. Um, so here, here's a, our slight problem though. JavaScript is a single threaded coding language. That means we can't create multiple worker threads. It's just one main thread that's gonna execute all of your code. Okay, so only one thing can be done at one time. Um, so the question is how can we actually do stuff asynchronously in JavaScript? And the answer to that is using asynchronous callback functions. So that seems like a mouthful to say, but we're gonna see an example and hopefully it kind of just makes sense. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, it's not vital to know this information. So just try to follow along. Um, hopefully you get the kind of the general concept here, um, but we'll just wanna kind of see an example and maybe understand how JavaScript kind of operates here. All right, so let's see an example um, with visuals. Um, so these are the key components of the asynchronous callback mechanism. Again, a lot of terminology here. You're not expected to memorize it. Just kind of understand the, the buzzwords that we're gonna use. So execution, these are the preliminary tasks that need to be completed um, elsewhere, uh, the callback is the stuff that we need to do once the execution, the main execution for whatever thread we spawned off is completed. Then we have two items called the event queue and event loop. The event queue basically stores um, the stuff that needs to be done, as in the callbacks that need to be executed. Once the execution for um, a task is done, we're going to execute a callback that callback will be stored in the event queue. So our main program is gonna to continue to run and the event queue is just gonna store all the callbacks that need to be executed once our main execution is done. The event loop is, I guess, the part of the engine that actually keeps checking um, if your call stack is now cleared and can be pushed, or if we can push callbacks to, to the call stack. So again, if you remember call stack, that's our main execution um, point where we put stuff on the call stack, gets executed and then gets pulled off the call stack. So the event loop again is sitting there kind of constantly checking the call stack. And if the call stack becomes empty, it will then start taking items off the event queue and putting them on the call stack for execution. 
All right, so again, just some buzzwords that we're gonna be using. So get to kind of get familiar with them, but um, let's see an example. So for this example, I'm gonna use a function called set timeout. This is a function uh, built into JavaScript. Um, if you've not used it before, it's pretty straightforward um, to use. Basically, it takes in two parameters. One is a callback function. So it's gonna be a function that we wanna call in the future. And then um, the second parameter is a delay in milliseconds. So it's an integer value um, and it specifies how much time you wanna wait until executing the callback function. So in this case, we have an example, um, a couple lines of code here. We create a callback that simply prints out the word world to the console. But using the set timeout function, we um, say execute my callback after waiting 6,000 milliseconds or six, six seconds in this case. All right, so your program will wait six seconds and then it'll execute um, the console log, printing out the world to your console. All right, so we're gonna be using a set timeout. So let's look at uh, some code here. All right, got a lot of boxes here. Hopefully you guys can follow along. My application are these five lines of code. I guess I have some extra code that's not on screen. Um, there's some code on our curriculum page. If I want to point that out, uh, we're done with this. So there's a wait function I implemented if you're curious on how that works. But essentially the job of wait is to actually wait that amount of time. Um, so let's actually see how this executes. So the first thing happens is something called the global context gets pushed push to the call stack. Um, you don't need to worry too much about that. Just kind of understand there's something that's on the call stack when your application starts. Then we get to our first line of code. So here we're gonna just um, do a console log of Oscar. So when that executes, it gets put, put on the call stack on top of the global execution context, and then it gets executed because there's no, nothing else you need to call. So we ex execute console.log Oscar, and that prints out Oscar to the output. Okay, pretty straightforward there. Then we get to creating a callback function. So in this case, I uh, create a, a variable called my callback and store um, this function that's gonna print out world to the console. All right, next I call set timeout, which we just saw before. Set timeout is gonna be pushed to the call stack. So notice it got added to the call stack. And then what's gonna happen is it's actually gonna be transferred to something called the web API. This is something that's built into um, pretty much every browser. So this is kind of your browser providing some functionality for us. What this is doing is kind of being our buddy or like our worker thread in that it's gonna take some work off of our hands and we're gonna continue with our main uh, execution point through our application. So it's gonna be executed from the call stack, but the way set timeout works is that it's gonna be pushed to the web API over here. So now that's taken off our call stack. So we're still going line by line through our code because again, JavaScript is synchronous, um, but this set timeout is kind of stored over here and it will be used shortly. All right, so again, this is outside of our application. Next, we get to this wait, and this is simply gonna just wait five seconds. And basically this is to simulate us doing some work. So let's say whatever work we're doing in our application, it's gonna take five seconds. So that wait gets pushed to the call stack. And then assuming five seconds elapsed, that wait gets pulled off the call stack. And then we continue on, we get to a console dog log of glow, that gets pushed to the call stack here. Then that gets added to our output. Right, so that was five seconds have elapsed, and then assuming six total seconds have elapsed, now the web API kind of fires because we have that timeout of six seconds. So after six seconds, um, the web API is going to um, push the callback to the event queue. All right, so now the event queue is going to have our callback, and the event loop is going to say is going to check the call stack and say, "Ask, are you empty? If it is, it's going to push." Uh, the my callback function to our call stack. So in this case, call stack was empty. So it's gonna look on the event queue, grab anything it finds in order. So queue, again, first in, first out. Um, it's gonna grab my callback, put it to um, our call stack, and then this will be executed. So um, our function here is just doing console log of world that gets pushed to our call stack. We print out world, then we remove the items from our call stack, and that's our application. All right, so again, this was kind of just showing all the steps that happen. The main idea here is that this web API kind of takes some of the load off of our application so that we could do stuff asynchronously 
by providing a callback that's going to be executed later. So it'll be pushed back to our call stack automatically by the event loop. This is nothing like we do not have to implement any of these um, items. They're already part of um, our development tools. All right, so I think it'd be kind of good to see this in play. I'm going to copy the code off of our curriculum page. All right, so we have two examples here. I'm going to grab the first example and put it into a new coding window. So let's say async.js. All right, here I'm going to paste the code that I just copied. And let's just quickly talk about it. So again, this is my wait function. Uh, the goal of this is you pass in some time value. It's going to do a while loop to basically just eat away time until we meet that time value. Um, all right, so here I'm simply printing out Oscar to the console. I'm going to wait five seconds. Again, that wait can just simulate you know some work that our application needed to do. After that, I'm going to print out hello. I'm going to wait another six seconds and then print out world. All right, so the question is, how long is this going to take to execute? So let me run this. It's going to be uh, node async. Yes. All right, so we got Oscar right away because there's no waiting before Oscar printed out. Then after five seconds, we should get in hello. And then maybe after six seconds, about now, we get world. All right, so we got our output of Oscar, hello, and world. Um, and that took about 11 seconds. And we waited five seconds here, six seconds here. Line 11 had to wait for line eight and nine to fully complete. So again, we were kind of blocked on our execution while we waited this five seconds. And then we had to wait another six seconds here. So again, we sum those up and we get 11 seconds that our application took to complete this task. All right, but the, uh, the idea here is that if these execution points or the work that we're doing here doesn't kind of rely on anything else as in whatever work is being simulated here on line eight doesn't rely on what's being done on line 11, those can be done um, asynchronously as in they don't have to wait on each other like we done on their own. So if we take this code and replace it with what we had before, I'm gonna swap this in here. Now we basically create a task of printing out uh, the world and we set that uh, timeout. So that basically this is gonna be done by the web API as in somewhere else outside of our application. And then we could proceed to do some work here. So again, both, uh, both tasks can be done in parallel. So this one takes five seconds. This one takes six seconds. Um, they'll both go on and uh, complete. All right, so we ran, if we run this, uh, we should get Oscar right away. Hello should pop up. And then right after that, in one second, we should get world. So notice that world came in about one second after hello got printed. That's because both tasks were being kind of done in parallel. Any questions about our code here? So you could set the set time out as 5,000, and then sometimes it'd be world hello, sometimes it'd be hello world. Um, great question. Uh, answer to that would be no, actually. So let me actually set my time out to 3,000. Let's see what's going to happen here. All right, so this, this event takes 3,000, uh, or three seconds, and this work on my 11 is going to take five seconds. So let's actually see if the ordering changes, because world, the Output of world should be printed out earlier to three seconds, but let's actually see what happens. And then we'll talk about why. So we got Oscar right away. We're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. We got hello and then world right away. So the question is what's going on here? Why did world show up still after hello showed up? It's because of that, that stack thing. It's checking the global context, sees that weight is there and it still throws itself on top and waits. Yep, so again, uh, as mentioned, the event loop is going to wait for your call stack to be fully empty before it pulls anything off the event queue. So in this case, if we change our value to three seconds, this callback is on our event queue while, while this is happening, sorry, while the wait's happening. So right now, if you can imagine it, when this wait is executing, there will be a callback already here because the set timeout has completed in three seconds instead of six seconds for the new example. So there will be an event or a callback to execute here. But the way it's all designed is that the event loop will not add items to your call stack until your uh, main line of execution is complete, as in this call stack is completely clear. So that's why the global context is kind of shown here, so that as your application runs, it's still got something on the call stack. 
So in this case, even though there's something ready to be, I guess, executed, the event loop will wait until you complete everything else in your main line of execution. So that's why the hello will still print out before the world does, because the way this works is that um, the event queue will st start getting added to the call stack once everything else is done. So we get the hello. And then right away, if you remember uh, in our execution, let it go. Um, if I run that again, notice that I get Oscar. Once hello is printed, world comes in right away. The world is ready to go. So it's just waiting, right? So both of these came in at the same time, but it still took five seconds because the work that hello had to do uh, was blocking our main line of execution. So uh, yeah, I wasn't thinking like the second one would have to be another callback routine like the first one to have them. Yep, yeah, we could try that. So if we made this another callback, I like that idea. Let me quickly do that. So um, if we make this a callback also, so we're just gonna do both of these items outside of our application scope. So we wanna print out hello and let's assume that's gonna take um, five seconds. Let's actually see if items get swapped. The question is, does the order where you call your I guess, set timeouts matter or does it actually matter when they complete? So in this case, we're gonna take three seconds for world, five seconds for hello. Let's see what our output actually shows this time. Um, I don't know if I need to change his name, but I'll do it just in case. And let's run that. All right, so we got Oscar. We got world and then we got hello. So in this case, yep, the order did change because we have two callbacks that are working separately. Whenever one finishes, it gets added to the queue. And again, if you remember your queue data structure, that's first in, first out. So the first item in is gonna be the world callback. And the second uh, item in is gonna be the uh, hello callback. So this will be in line to get executed before our second callback in this case. Yep, so in that case, okay. the order changes. Yep, what was that done? If we wanted to use two APIs and one of them says, uh, you know, show us how many <clears throat> zebras are in Tanzania and the other one says, show us a map and we, we go off to get both of those, it, it won't actually do both of them simultaneously. Um, it will do that simultaneously if you have callbacks. But if, it, so we can do two external events simultaneously? Yeah, so both of these, again, this didn't, my application did not take eight seconds. It took approximately five seconds. So this one is done in three seconds, and this was done in five. So if I run this again, we, should, we can maybe count. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, right? So yeah, these, these asynchronous items, they don't wait on each other either. They, they can be done in parallel. The web API can handle it. Um, I'm again, I'm not going to say this, but with authority, because I'm not sure about all the magic in the web API, but I'm assuming that can be multi-threaded and can do stuff, you know, properly asynchronously versus JavaScript has to do stuff in order. So that's why we got to kind of like use these methods to simulate asynchronous behavior in JavaScript. All right. So the whole takeaway here is, um, set timeout again, obviously we're not actually doing any work, but for web development, where we're making requests on the web. There's no guarantee that's going to, you know, how long it's going to take. If you're requesting a lot of data or your internet connection is slow or whatever the situation might be, um, you don't want to halt your application while you're waiting for resources to come in unless you have to, right? So I guess one example would be when you're logging into Facebook, Facebook is not, you know, you're not going to see the login screen kind of spinning as it's trying to pull in all your photos and all your data. Like that's going to be done asynchronously or even delayed as in it probably doesn't need to pull in all your photos until you actually click like your photos tab, right? So um, in that case where you have a bunch of resources you need, generally for web development, you wanna do them all asynchronously so they all can be done in parallel and your application just doesn't have like a spinner or just like doesn't load like text that you have that the user can read while other background resources might still be loading. I've got a question about that, Ankur. Go for it. So regarding that, like it just makes it uh, easier to kind of like navigate, right? Like, so you're not just waiting on everything to load at once, right? It makes it more functional for the user. Yep. Yeah, that's, yep. Kyle, Kyle nailed, it, nailed it on the head. Um, that's, that's the whole point of designing web pages in this manner. You don't want, you don't want your, your user to be waiting like, even like, you know, three, five seconds for a web page to load. In you know, today's day and age where it's fast internet, like that's an eternity, right? So when I go to a page, I should be able to see like parts of it even if some other data is still kind of loading and going to come in maybe one or two seconds later. 
but yeah, it, it's for user experience and just again, speeding up the web page so that you can do a bunch of stuff together instead of doing items one by one and kind of just loading stuff one by one. Okay, so that was our intro into asynchronous JavaScript. Again, if that kind of went over your head, that's totally fine. You're not gonna have to deal with this, um, this level of um, detail for anything in our curriculum, but I think it's just good to know about. Um, definitely looking at the set timeout function. There's also a function called set interval that we might've seen. Um, I think for the whack-a-mole challenge or set interval. So that's another asynchronous function um, that exists. <clears throat> Okay, so that's asynchronous JavaScript in a nutshell. Let's complete this example. Okay, next up are JavaScript promises. So unlike all the asynchronous stuff we just talked about, this is a concept that you guys will definitely need to know. And unfortunately it is not, I would say straightforward. It takes a while, it took me a while to kind of just understand it. Um, the syntax is a little weird, but kind of the way that promises work is not what we've dealt with something something like we've dealt with before. So again, definitely take your time on this. We're gonna, you know, if you have questions, please ask. Um, the syntax, again, will take some time to get used to. So read um, references and documentation, just get more familiar with the concept of promises. All right, for now, we're gonna take a quick break to eat some cereal. So here's Love Crunch cereal. This is the cereal I mentioned before. Um, I don't know, I really like it. It's, uh, they're really chocolatey, unlike other chocolate cereals, which I feel like are kind of sugary. Uh, Love Crunch, I really feel like has a good uh, good chocolate taste to them. Definitely not like the healthiest, but it's organic. I guess that's a bonus. Um, they are expensive boxes of cereal. So again, they come in 10 ounce sizes, which is pretty tiny. Um, for me, like more, uh, like more than half a box is just one serving. So they go pretty quick. And they're also kind of pricey in terms of cereal standards, but I don't know, I think they're worth it. So if you've never had them and you like cereal, I'd say give them a try. Uh, maybe I could pick up an endorsement from Nature's Path uh, for this, but who knows? All right, so we're gonna eat, eat some cereal here. So here, I'm gonna simulate this via some code. Um, so I've written up some code here. Again, this is available on our curriculum page. So let me grab that from here. Um, that's promises, we have cereal somewhere. Yep. Okay, so let me take that code. Let me create a new file, call it serial.js. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, well, I wanna have some cereal. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna grab a bowl and then I'm gonna set a timeout for pouring the cereal. So let's assume, again, I can't really pour milk and pour cereal at the same time. If you are able to, you're probably way more talented than I am. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pour my cereal. And let's just say that's gonna take approximately three seconds. After I complete pouring my cereal, I'll execute my callback. So, you know, pour cereal will take three, three seconds. Then I'll get to executing, hey, we poured some cereal. So that's assuming we complete pouring cereal. Next up, we'll be pouring some milk. So here I have another callback nested within uh, my first callback of pour cereal. Again, pour cereal is my callback function. So after three seconds, or cereal is going to be called, or cereal has this logic in it, which has another callback. So in this case, we're going to create four milk. That's going to take three seconds to execute. And then um, we'll complete that task after three seconds. Um, big, big point to understand here is that cereal always goes in first and then milk. I know there are some people out there that claim the opposite, that that's just plain wrong. Milk does not go first. If, uh, if there's any question there. Um, all right, so let's kind of run this and see what happens. So again, we're just printing out some statements after we complete the action. So if I run this, um, serial uh, node, serial.js. All right, let's see what happens. So three seconds should elapse. I should pour some cereal. All right, great. Um, three seconds after that, we should pour milk, and then we should be ready to eat after that. All right, uh, any, any questions about what's going on here? Okay, let's, uh, let's make it a little more advanced. So this is real world, world situation. I love cereal. 
Um, but oftentimes I'm not the best at washing my dis dishes. So I live alone. So I could kind of get my uh, sink to pile up with dishes. Isn't the best practice, but I get pretty lazy after I eat. So I usually don't wash my dish right after using it. Let's say I'm out of bowls and I need to have a clean bowl. So I can't pour my cereal just yet because I need to wash some dishes. So I'm going to extend this quote example and it's going to get a little more unsightly. So hopefully you bear with me. But now I added a new task, I guess, in my order of operations. So in this case, um, wash dishes is my first task. And these tasks rely on each other. So I can't do them, you know, kind of in parallel because I'm only one person. I got to do one at a time. Um, so here, my first task is going to be, I want to wash a bowl and a spoon. Once I complete that, we're going to do our other two tasks we did before, which is pour cereal. And then after that, pour some milk. So in this case, you know, my set timeout, let's assume it takes me 15 seconds to quickly wash a bowl and a spoon so that I can use it to uh, eat some cereal. So now we've added another callback within a callback. So we have wash dishes, which has a callback in it of pour cereal. And then we have another callback of pour milk. So these, these are just nested callbacks. Um, there is a term for, you know, this kind of design of code. And it's not a favorable term. It, this is something called callback hell. All right, so you guys can kind of Google this and see maybe more severe examples of this. But the reason why this is called callback hell is because again, we're having these callbacks nested within callbacks, nested within callbacks. Again, this is only three tasks. Let's say I have like a dozen tasks to kind of code up here. Um, this can get kind of like very nested. And like, if you can imagine indentation, it's gonna be like probably off my screen at that point. So I'm just gonna have all these things nested between each other. All right, so the um, important thing here is that this, design works. There's nothing logically wrong with setting up your um, callbacks like this. Kyle, I see you have a question. I do. Uh, is there a standard practice for like how many callbacks you actually want to run like within? Nope. I mean, I don't think there's, again, there's no theoretical limitation that I know. Of. Um, there, there's no standard that I know of either. Again, this is totally acceptable code in the sense that it works and completes what we need it to do. So in this case, if I ran this code, let me Grab that from our curriculum page. I'm not going to wait 15 seconds, so I'll change that. But all right, so I'm going to modify our example here. So let's add that third, that other level of callback. So we're going to wash dishes. I'm going to change that to five seconds for the quick wash. So I run this. Um, so it's going to take five seconds. Again, it's going to work. We're going to wash a bowl and a spoon. That should come up there. Um, after three seconds, you know, we pour our favorite cereal into a bowl, we get uh, poured some cereal, and then we pour some milk on top. All right, so we still, this works totally correctly, nothing wrong with this, aside from the fact that the design is not, I guess, ideal in terms of a development standpoint. Okay, so then the question is, how do we actually resolve this or redesign it to be kind of in a better, um, better structure? And the answer to that, as you might have guessed, promises. So the question is, what is a promise? So a promise is a declaration or assurance that one will, will do a particular thing or something that will happen. So it's a guarantee that something's gonna happen. Uh, again, we again, this is just a common, common word that we deal with. So hopefully the concept of promise just in everyday speak um, is kind of evident to everyone. All right, so again, um, luckily promises in JavaScript essentially are the same thing and that it guarantees something's going to happen after um, completion. So what is a JavaScript promise? So it's a mechanism that promises to deliver a result. Um, the result, again, may not be success. So again, let's say we give a task and let's say I give a task to Alex to say to ask him, like, what's what's the capital of Atlantis? Let's say that information can't be found. Um, Alex might come back and say, hey, I actually was unable to complete that task, and he'll report that to me. So regardless of if, if the task is successful or failed, you'll still get a result back. So that's part of that's designed with JavaScript promises. All right, so as mentioned, you'll get a value back upon completion, and regardless of completion or failure, uh, a callback will be, will be triggered by your promise. All right, so again, a promise is just like a, it's a special uh, type in JavaScript that's going to guarantee a result and will kind of uh, do some work and then give you back a result when it's complete with whatever task it is doing. 
All right, it's gonna pause there. So there's a lot of uh, technical terms there. Let's kind of digest that. But I think it'd be better as always to see an example. So let's look at the syntax for creating a promise. So there's two parts to it. First, we need to create a promise. Um, I've highlighted, I guess, uh, a couple of the important parts, but basically you need to create a new promise um, object. <clears throat> so you use a new keyword and then promise with a capital P. This is a predefined um, type. So you gotta name it appropriately. So you create a new promise <clears throat> and the input um, to a promise is basically two callbacks. One callback I've here, I've named it on success. Again, you can name these whatever you want to. Um, one call, the first one is gonna be your on success callback as in if I, you know, requested a task, again, if I ask Alex to look up something for me, if he's successful, <clears throat> he as like a worker thread would call the on success callback and say, I've succeeded, I'm gonna pass back a value um, to your on success handler. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but let's say again, on the other hand, let's say he was unable to complete his task successfully. Well, we also provide an on failure um, callback. Again, you can name these whatever you want. I've named it on failure. So that if he does fail, he'll report back and call the on failure uh, callback with whatever value we want to pass back. In this case, I'm passing strings back to my callbacks. But again, this could be any data type you can imagine in JavaScript. You could pass back a list, you could pass back an integer, um, whatever is appropriate for your use case, you could pass back to your callbacks. All right, so again, this is creating a promise. You do use a new keyword, capital P promise, and then have a structure like this where um, you have an anonymous function that takes in two callbacks and the function will basically do something. So here I have a function called do something. We don't know what it's doing. Eventually we'll get a success or a failure back. If we success, uh, successfully complete our task, we'll again, call our on success, else we'll call our on fit. Okay, so that's creating a promise. Hey, Andrew, real quick, so there's to... gonna be, oh, go ahead, Sarah, I'm sorry. Do you actually have to write that if else, or is that like logic handled by uh, the promise? Um, good question. Uh, generally, if you're creating a promise yourself, you're probably gonna have a structure like this where, again, you have some execution needs to do. Again, we, we could use our imagination for what, what that has to be. But yeah, you're gonna probably have some check of, hey, if what do we need to do if we're successful? Call the on success, else call the failure. So yes, generally speaking, you will manually kind of have an if else statement based on whatever your success condition is. Hey, Andrew, I was going to ask you for the first line um, with new promise. Is that is that supposed to be a space there because promise is actually a declaration, or is there supposed to be an underscore, or it's supposed to be camel case one word? Yep, uh, thanks for asking. Always good to make sure we know our syntax. So this is actually a space. So the new is a keyword in JavaScript. Um, and that's this is how we create instances of, <clears throat> of classes here. So promise, I assume is a class. We're creating an instance here. So I'm storing that in my, my promise variable. Um, so yeah, promise, a new space, capital P, promise. Uh, yeah, good to know the syntax. All right, so that's for creating a promise. The second part of using a promise is actually consuming it. So we're gonna go to syntax for consuming a promise. So the first line, let's just assume that was from my previous slide. Again, I don't have too much room on my slides to write all the code. So that promise is what I created on the previous slide where we do a new promise, have a handler and do some stuff there. <clears throat> to consume a promise, you will likely see syntax like this. You're gonna have some um, callbacks. In this case, I've created a handle success callback and a handle failure callback. So this is something I've coded up and all these are gonna do for my case are just gonna print out some things to the console. So if, I, if whatever task the promise was um, gonna guarantee, if that was successful, I'll just print out a message with a success tag. <clears throat> and then if my task hypothetically failed, then my failure would just print out failure and the message. So they both do the same thing, but handle it kind of with a different tag ahead of it. Wait, where is my promise actually used? Um, <clears throat> good question. So that's down here. Um, am I forgetting? Oh, so you're just defining the methods that are used. Yeah, so still... there's this dot then. So again, promises kind of tricky to understand. So this dot then <clears throat> is basically going to trigger only when this promise resolves itself. 
So again, the dot then will either call the on success um, handler or the, uh, sorry, the handle success handler or the handle failure function, um, depending on what the promise is returned. So again, if we go back to our um, construction or creation of here, our promise might call either callback based on whatever do something, whether that function actually returns for the success. So again, we have both these handlers. We don't know which one's going to get called. And we don't know if our task can be successful or not. But whenever it does complete, one of these handlers will get called. <clears throat> All right, so this is consuming a, pro a promise. The, the keyword, the key function here is the dot then. <clears throat> this will only um, kind of fire once the promise returns something. And so the handle success and failures message is that an argument or a return type? I forget. This is an argument. So you were creating just anonymous functions here. So this is saying one input to this function. In this case, it's going to be something called message. We know, again, you got to know what structures you're working with. So in this case, my promise is always going to return a string. So I'm just going to assume it's a string and print out the console. So okay. then why in the last line don't you have a parameter in those? Um, because that's coming from these callbacks here. So on success, we'll pass a string. Um, so again, if you guys <clears throat> can kind of follow along, whatever, everything I have here is what I'm doing on the first line up here. So again, it's kind of hard to see code on slides. So we'll actually do this in our coding window. But this is the promise I created in the previous slide. That will pass back a string to one of these handlers based on what happens inside the promise. So once a promise completes, again, we don't know how long it might take. It might take a second, it might take an hour. We don't know what, what, what's gonna happen. But one that completes is gonna either say, hey, I succeeded, here's a message for your success case, or hey, I failed, here's a message for your failure case. Okay. My brain was turned inside out when you did this, but okay. it makes sense now. What you showed us first is, is how the promise is handled. When you're showing us and consuming, that's the code we write to ask for the promise. Yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, the way you kind of say it, yeah. So yeah, this dot then will say, let me wait on the promise resolve and then I'll handle it um, accordingly. So let's actually see an example again. This might be kind of confusing just to see it on slides, but let's, um, let's see an example. So I'm gonna go back to the example that we had before where I wanna eat some cereal. So I'm gonna code that up on my screen and actually I'm not gonna code it up manually. I have it copied here, uh, if I can find it. Thought I had it somewhere here. Okay. Um, where did that go? All right, I'm not sure where it went. So let's, oh, it must be on the page. There it is. All right. So we want to go to the curriculum page because I coded it up there. All right. So I'm going to copy all this code. I don't want to write it by hand. And then we'll talk about it. So copy that. Uh, let me comment all that stuff out. Eh, I'll get rid of it. Okay, so this is my new code that's using uh, promises instead of using uh, callbacks like I was doing before. So here uh, I have wash dishes, which creates a promise, um, for cereal, which also creates a promise and for milk. So let's go through this one line by line because there's a lot to kind of take in here. So let's look at wash dishes. What's wash dishes gonna do? Well, that's gonna return a promise once we complete the task in here, All right? So that um, the promise task is basically a set timeout in this case. So we're gonna simulate doing work here. So assuming that wash dishes takes 15 seconds, I'll change that to five seconds. Um, when this completes, it's gonna call the on success um, handler. So we're assuming that there's never gonna be a failure. So in this case, on failure is not used by a promise. We're gonna assume that once you know, we spend 15 seconds or five seconds in this case, we're gonna succeed washing our bowl and spoon and then we'll proceed on to calling the success handler. All right, the pour cereal uh, method here will take in a result. That result is what this on success is gonna to pass to it. So in this case, we'll get a result of we washed a bowl and spoon um, in the pour cereal function here. We'll print that out. So that's kind of like what happened with the previous task. And then we'll continue to do the task at hand. In this case, we need to pour some cereal. So again, similar to how the callbacks were working before, we call set timeout. 
And that's going to take three seconds. Once that completes, we're going to call our on success handler. In that case, it's going to go to pour milk and do the same thing. It's going to take a result. In that case, the result will be we poured some cereal. And then we'll print that to the console and then do our task here, which is pour some milk. All right. Um, you might be asking, well, how are these connected? How is wash dishes, pour cereal, and pour milk going to communicate with each other? The answer is all the way down here. So this is how <clears throat> this is how uh, we actually execute and consume a promise. So the first thing is wash dishes. That's a function, right? So we're calling a function here. So let's take a look at our function here. So this function is just going to return a promise. All right, so wash dishes returns a promise object. Then we have a dot then. So again, dot then is the sort of the magic here where the dot then will only execute once this promise com completes. So the promise that's returned by wash dishes, um, when that completes, it's gonna call your dot then that's kind of tacked on here. The dot then here has two handlers. One is poor cereal, which we talked about before, and something called go hungry, which I created right here. So the go hungry is the failure case. So let's say something went wrong with me washing my dishes. Let's say I broke my bowl and then I can't proceed. Then I'm just gonna call my go hungry handler and that's gonna print out whatever message I get back. And then, oh, sorry, go hungry down here. We're gonna print out our error message that we get back and then write out, hey, I'm still hungry because we're, we're not eating our cereal. So when, what is this dot thing gonna do? Well, let's look at poor cereal. Poor cereal, returns another promise. So we're actually chaining promises here. So for serial returns a promise and that we put a dot then on the promise returned by poor serial. All right, so again, we have a bunch of dot thens here chained together. Again, syntax takes a while to get used to. What's going on here? Promise here, when it completes, call dot then. Um, on success, poor serial returns another promise. Then we pour milk. Uh, when pour milk completes, that promise will execute eat breakfast. So we look at eat breakfast. Now we've kind of finished up our chain. We have no more promises that we um, had to fulfill. So in this case, we just print out the result and print out, hey, we can eat now. So that promise, this is no longer um, going to continue our chain. All right. So if you we'll have an error in the first method will you get an error in all three uh good question so if you get an error this chain will not continue anymore so if we actually want to see this let me um go back to my slides but we'll actually run this code and actually see it execute but i just want to get through our slides so again this is kind of what i coded up or we what we had coded up where we have these chained dot fence so we first we wash dishes then we pour cereal pour milk eat breakfast the reason i'm highlighting this is just to kind of clarify this is our on success handler and this is our on failure handler. I'm just matching up the coloring I chose for the previous slides. All right, um, again, another way you can chain promises, um, kind of talking about the error handling, is you could put a catch at the very end if your error handler is gonna be the same for all, like your entire chain of promises. So in this case, instead of having the same error handler kind of added onto the dot then as two parameters on success, on failure, you can add just a simple catch at the very end. And any error that happens, either with poor cereal, with poor milk, or with eating breakfast, or I guess with washing dishes also, it'll be caught by this, um, this uh, statement here and be handled by Go Hungry. Can you have more than one catch? Um, good question. With try catches, you can catch different types of exceptions. So I would assume you probably could have different types here, but I've not actually done that. So I'm gonna say, probably Google that but rather than kind of having me answer that. Um, but usually you're just gonna have one handler here. So um, to go with this design. So if I change my code to that, uh, let's take away this. I'll turn the comma there, you wanna catch. And so basically any error that happens, if I fail at washing my dishes, if I fail at pouring my cereal or if I fail at pouring my milk, I'm just gonna go hungry. So I can't have my cereal and I'll be sad. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of this and let's actually run this code and make sure it works like before. 
All right, so again, this is our main execution. Everything above is just creating um, some functions and uh, those functions create promises and report some results. So given this, let me run this code. Clear my console here. I'm gonna run node serial.js. Okay, so wash dishes, I put five seconds on there. So after five seconds, we should hopefully get a message. Hey, we washed a bowl and spoon, great. Next up, we wanna pour some cereal. And then three seconds after that, we should pour some milk and we can eat. All right, so we had the same output as before, but we kind of alleviated that callback hell by actually using this ch chaining construct where we create a promise and then chain some dot thens on them so that they're gonna be executed in order. And again, this is much more easy to parse visually than what we had before with the callbacks within callbacks within callbacks. So it kind of just makes your code a little flatter. Again, we, these aren't really nested. Um, these are, you know, we could, I, I would argue this is better designed just because it's easy to read, but um, the main benefit is your code execution just looks much cleaner. Um, so let's, let's try an error case. So let's say, um, let's say we spilled some cereal. So let's say in this case, we spilled some cereal and that's going to kind of abort our operation. So if I'm pouring cereal and I spill it, let's just say I'm not going to eat cereal because I made a mess. So in this case, I'm going to call my on failure um, callback. And so this will basically abort the chain. So I should see if I, uh, if this works correctly, I should wash my dishes. Then I should try to pour some cereal, but I'll get an error. So I should never get to the pour milk stage. So if I run this, clear node cereal.js. All right, we wash the bowl and spoon. We're pouring some cereal. Oh, we spilled some cereal and now I'm still hungry. All right, so again, this chain gets aborted when any one of these uh, promises fail to uh, successfully return a result. Sorry, when, when the promises get a failure case. So the go hungry gets triggered and then we, we don't get to the poor milk part of this or the eat breakfast. We just handle it and go hungry and that's the end of our chain here. All right, what questions do you guys have about promises? I know it's a lot to take in. I, I'm not gonna uh, sit here and say it's, you know, should be obvious stuff, because again, promises are a whole nother beast that we've not seen before. Well, this is all sequential. Presumably the promises can be used asynchronously? Uh, correct, yes. So in this case, this example, um, this is sequential where one task relies on the other. So that's how we're chaining it. But if we had like, three independent tasks we need to do. Yes, we could fire up three different promises, kind of like just what we did with set timeout. If you remember, sorry, where we have that set timeout, we're printing out Oscar, Polo, and World. In that case, like those tasks can be done independently. One doesn't rely on the other. So in that case, yeah, you could create three promises, fire them off, and then whenever they're done, they'll get back to your application and be executed, just like how set timeout works with. So do the the um, promise functions have to be called on success and on failure. Um, <clears throat> sorry, could you repeat your question, Sarah? In the parameters for promise, do you have to pass in specifically on success and on failure? And how does um, passing in um, stuff to on success work? Yep. Uh, good question. So these are just variable names. So you have the freedom to call them whatever you want. I've, I've, you know, been consistent with calling it on success and on failure, but that's just, um, this is just for consistency. You can name them whatever you want. So in this case, I could change this to good and bad, like just kind of make them still descriptive of, you know, success and fail. In this case, I would just call the bad callback. Because again, this is just, <clears throat> this is some value that whoever's calling my, um, whoever's going to, I guess, sorry, in this case, this promise is gonna call these values. So whoever's supplying these values has to specify what functions they are. So in this case, we look at our, <clears throat> our uh, structure here, we're passing in poor serial as our good and our go hungry is passed in as our bad. So in this case, um, the bad here is gonna be handled by go hungry. Yep, so these, again, these can be named whatever you want. Um, just kind of understand that one, you call if you're successful, and you call the other if you're not successful. 
I think we had another example on our curriculum page, so it might be worth going over. It's a simpler example that I probably should have started with right here. Um, let's quickly run that and then we'll take a break. So promise.js. Uh, again, I'm copying this from our curriculum page. Um, so this is going off the, I guess, extending the example I had before. In this case, I have a function called do something. And that's going to randomly return either true or false. In this case, 75% of the time, we're going to return true, simulating, hey, we successfully completed our task. 25% of the time, or roughly 25% 20 of the time, it should fail. So again, we create a promise. And then we want to execute this promise. So if I do um, my promise, then um, what do I want to do here? So I'm not copy everything. Oh, there it is. Sending a promise. All right, so we create a promise up here. We consume it down here. And then uh, what do I want here? Is this correct? So we have no promise such as. OK, there was an error. So again. We ran this once, we got an error. If I run this a few times, let me bring this up. We should get success like three out of four times. So if we run this, error. All right, we got a success. Seems like we're failing a lot, but theoretically it should be every three out of four times we should be successful. But notice it, it calls different callbacks each time. So if we fail, let's look at this code. Okay, we call do something and that randomly returns true or false, but 75% of the time we should succeed. Um, then we call our on success handler. In this case, that's handle success. So we print out success and the message that we pass back. Again, in this case, I'm passing back strings. But again, this could be a list. This could be anything you want it to be. So if you want to change this to like a list of strings, that should be fine. Any data type works. So if we do it this way, we'll just print out the list. All right, so kind of stare at this code, make sure you understand, again, creating a promise up here. A promise takes in a function. That function takes in two parameters. One is a callback for success, uh, success case, and the other is a callback for if your task failed. And then you call one of two fail back, uh, callbacks, depending on you know, what, what you deem is successful. So after the after the promise executes, my promise contains the results that you can access with dot then? Uh, sort of. So the dot then is going to be called once your promise is done. So your promise doesn't really store the values. It's passing back a value through one of these lines. So your promise guaranteed is going to do something. And then it'll determine, again, you get to control what your success case is. So assuming that you're successfully like, all right, we computed this value correctly. Let me report that back. And that'll be handled by one of your callbacks. But if you failed, then that'll be handled by whatever failure case you want to do. In this case, I'm just printing out to the console. But other, you might want to do other things. Like if you failed at computing something, maybe you want to compute it in a different way. Or you want to do a different task. If you failed, let's do this other path in our ap application rather than uh, the success case. Uh, quick question, Oker. So then it's like an order of operations, like my promise, then do this, then yep. do that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, luckily they named it kind of sensibly. Yeah, the dot then, again, if we saw our previous example of cereal, yep, this is going to be done in order. We're going to wash dishes, then we're going to pour some cereal, then pour some milk, then we're going to eat breakfast. But if there's an error anyway, any way along here, we're just going to go hungry, and that's the end of this chain. As in, we, if one thing fails, um, the way this contract works is we're not going to continue to try to do other stuff. Um, we can, you know, obviously do more stuff down here. Like we call do something. This stuff will execute. It's only this chain that kind of stops executing. So your programs are going to kind of halt if you get an error. Um, but that chain will stop doing whatever it's doing. So you can have multiple different chains and they will, you know, do what they want to do. Okay. I know that was a lot to take in. Um, Alex, is there a question? Yeah, I was kind of wondering, so with the, I guess the flow at the bottom, could you do it almost like a try with your thin catch or no? Uh, yeah, I believe that works. So question was, can you do a try and maybe catch like this? 
Um, I know you can do this with uh, the next construct we're going to talk about, but let's uh, let's try this and we'll take a break and then get back to uh, any more questions. With that. So in this case, uh, we want to catch something. I think this should work. Uh, let's try it. All right, so we still have an error case up for serial. Up here is bad at pouring serial. So we call our failure um, case and replace this. So it's named a little better. So on failure, we still have milk. Um, let's see if this works. Clear. Serial. Yes. Okay. Let's see if this works. Uh, we should get we wash dishes after five seconds. There you are. And then after three seconds, we should see the error. Oh. All right. So we got an unhandled exception. So it looks like this does not work. It looks like we need to catch here. But yeah, good good question. Always good to try stuff. Um, I guess you can't do that with dot friends. So that's the structure you want. Okay, uh, that's a lot to digest. Uh, we definitely earned ourselves a break. So I have 11.21 on my end. Let's take a nine minute break. And then we're, we'll talk a little bit more about consuming promises and then continue on from there. Cool, right. thank you. See you guys in a bit. All right, so we talked about um, using, you know, chaining promises together using the dot then uh, function. So again, dot then will basically allow you to do you uh, resolve one promise and then take the result of that promise and continue on to do something else? And then if that creates another promise, then that will do the same thing where we chain a dot then. So once we, you know, for example, complete pouring our cereal, we'll proceed to pour our milk, which will guarantee a result. Either we pour our milk successfully or maybe we spill their milk and then, you know, we'll not be able to eat breakfast then. All right, so that was my serial example of some tests that our application was trying to simulate. Um, for serial. Okay, let's talk about alternative ways or one alternative way um, rather than using the dot then contract. So there's um, a couple of keywords, uh, one being await a and the other being a async. async. Um, and this is one way you can kind of not use the dot then, but still achieve the same results. Um, again, there's two different ways to kind of achieve the same exact thing. So I don't know if you guys like having that option where you feel like, okay, I could use this or that, or you'd rather have one way of doing things. But in this case, there are there's a different way we could go about it. So let's kind of convert what we have here using async and await. Um, so the one, one main caveat for using async is that you actually need a function, a surrounding, parent function to actually create an async um, function. So in this case, <clears throat> I'm going to create a function and call it prep breakfast. And that will have all of this logic in it. Uh, Kyle, you have a question? Yes. So uh, I, I like having multiple options, but I'm wondering, is there a trade-off between each one? <clears throat> um. Not a trade-off. Again, um, don't, one caveat with using async is that you need to create a new function to kind of surround the logic that you want to make uh, asynchronous. So in this case, um, same example where I need to wash dishes, pour cereal, pour milk. It's my breakfast, breakfast example. Um, I'll move that in here. So now we create this function called prep breakfast. And I'm going to call this function right here. All right. So this is my execution point where I call into that function. But now that we have this function, we can take advantage of the async await construct. So there's two parts to it. One is that you create a function, but put the keyword of async before it. All right. Um, and then you can use a magic keyword called await. So await can only be used in functions that are asynchronous. If you do not um, have an asynchronous, func asynchronous function, you try to use await, You'll get an error um, when you try to build your application saying, hey, you can't use a wait without async. So there are paired keywords. So we have this async function now. Again, normally we just create functions, right, um, with the keyword function. But if you have this, you can create async. And this allows you to use awaits, which is our next keyword we're going to talk about. 
So previously we had, uh, you know, the dot then kind of change. Nothing wrong with that. Again, much, I think that's cleaner than what we had before with callbacks. But in case you don't care to use a dot then, you can use um, a wait. And the way a wait works is I'm going to create a result. Uh, so wash dishes is going to be executed and pass back a result. But I need to wait on wash dishes to complete, right? So I look at wash dishes. This will take some amount of time. It's actually a promise that's going to run. So I don't want to proceed to pour my cereal until wash dishes is complete. So to do that, I use an await keyword. So I'm going to put await before the function call. So now what this is saying is, oops, what this is saying is wait for the, this to fully complete, as in wait for the promise um, in here to resolve, and then return the result that the promise goes back. Once I have that result, I can then proceed to pour cereal. So here I'll change this to results and then await pouring cereal. And so pour cereal takes in my result from the previous operation, right? If you remember our callback was structured, so uh, we take in a result and we just console log it to kind of signify that the previous event completed. So in this case, we have result, we pass that in and we do the same thing with pour cereal. And likewise, we'll do that with pour milk. So pour cereal returns another result. We store that in our existing variable. Um, and then in this case, we pour milk. And then finally, when we finish that, um, we return eats breakfast. Results. Now, something else from our structure that we need to change is uh, notice we have no error handling going on here. So this is where the try catch structure um, does come in place. We need to, generally speaking, you want to surround your await calls with a try and a catch. So basically, it'll try to execute any one of these items. If any one of these throws an error, it'll be caught by the catch statement here. So let's catch an error, and we'll console, or I guess we'll call go hungry like before. All right, so again, all of this is on the curriculum page, but just a different way instead of using dot then, um, you can use async on your function declaration. Again, we created a new function because we wanted to use, use async await structure. So we create an async function, and then we use these await keywords. All right, so we'll wash dishes. Once that completes, we'll get a result. We'll pass that result to poor serial, and poor serial will, ex serial will execute and do whatever it needs to do. We wait on that. Again, that's what the await keyword is doing. If we did not put this await there, what this will actually return would be a promise, right? So we look at poor serial. What is poor serial actually returning? Poor serial is re actually returning a promise object. And that's usually not what we want. We want that to kind of complete and then we can continue on from there. So instead of just capturing a result, this await keyword says resolve that promise that comes back from poor serial. And then once that's complete, use the result that's produced. All right, in this case, I do not have an 08 keyword on my eat breakfast because eat breakfast, there's no promise that's being created here. So I could just call that and I'll execute. All right, so if you run this, we should get the same result. Um, let's verify that by quickly running it. So I'm gonna clear my console, run, uh, not Python, node serial.js. And hopefully we get the same thing. So five seconds, we should wash our bowl and spoon. Then after three seconds, we just pour some cereal into a bowl. And then after three more seconds, we complete pouring milk and then we can eat. Uh, but if we get an error, so let's say we spill some milk. Spill, spill some milk. We want that to be a failure result. In this case, the same thing should happen sort of as before, where if we spill some milk, we shouldn't get to eating our breakfast. So this should not be executed. All right, so notice we spilled some milk and therefore instead of getting, you know, now we can eat, uh, go hungry got called and it says I'm still hungry, right? Because that's what go hungry is doing. It's taking an error message. In this case, the error message is we spilled some milk and that's printing that out and then printing out, I'm still hungry. All right, so just another way to do it with async await 
it's up to you what you want to do. There's, I wouldn't say there's any wrong, wrong way to go about it. I tend to prefer the async await way just because I like looking at this and saying, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to wait for this result and then continue on to the next line of code. So it's going to be asynchronous, but still kind of seems synchronous here. So we're going to go line by line. Line 33 will fully complete in this case, and then line 34 will execute with the results from line 33. And this is simulating async behavior by using this await keyword inside of a async function. Any questions about async awaits? Um, one very important thing to keep in mind, this is not apparent and it's just something you gotta deal with. So maybe this might be a drawback from using async wait. Always understand if you create an async function, this function right here will always return a promise. Even if I do something like, you know, return four, this is not gonna actually return an integer for me. It's gonna be a promise wrapped around this, this four. I know that sounds a little weird, but that's kind of how async functions are designed to work and that they always return you a promise. So just keep that in mind that any async function, whatever this returns, like let results equal that, this is going to return a promise. So if I actually want this for in my result here, I would need to add a wait here. So this is going to actually, sorry, I can't do that. This is not an async function. So in this case, I need to use a dot then. So I do let result equal dot then. Uh, I don't want to be here. So I don't want to return up here. Uh, dot then we get some result value. All right, so we're going to call our async function. That's going to return a promise that we consume with the dot then. So let's just print out uh, console log uh, results. All right, so this should print out a four for us. So let's say uh, end result. All right, let's see this, if this works. So run this. So again, this is async function. It's going to execute all this stuff, or I guess in this case, I have an error, so the call go hungry. But finally, we'll return a four, which gets wrapped in a promise. So we consume that promise here with the dot then. Again, this is different. Let me show it the other way. So this is the correct way. Correct. But you know, it's very easy to make a mistake. Like, hey, I'm calling a function. Let me just grab the result. So let's do prep breakfast. It's very tempting to think, okay, this is going to print out four. So when I say wrong, it's not going to break. You're still going to print out something, but it's not going to be the something you would expect. So if I comment up my correct way, um, call that incorrect. So again, I'm returning a four here. So, you know, me as a coder might be like, okay, I'm grabbing a result from my function, which is four. I'm going to print that out um, here. Let's see what actually happens. Notice I get promise pending. That's what got printed out line 47. The reason that happened is because line 46 got called and we didn't wait for this to complete. So in this case, we got a promise back to us and that's at a state of pending because it was not resolved at this point. Once it Executed line 46, they executed line 47 right away. And at that point, the result was a pending promise. So talking about promise states, um, there are three states you can, you can get for a promise. Pending, um, as you might guess, means the promise still has not resolved, as in it hasn't reached an endpoint. Um, so it's still working. Um, fulfilled uh, status means it succeeded in its, in its task. So if we actually printed a promise out after it completed, we should see a fulfilled result. So in here we have pending. We should see fulfilled if we printed a promise out after the fact. Um, and then the third uh, state is rejected. So that's the case where we failed whatever task the promise was attempting to um, complete, and it will still report back to you. It's not going to kind of just go into the ethos and never come back. It's going to say, hey, I tried, but I failed, so my status is rejected. I'm not sure if we could try to see the status in place. Let's actually, uh, let's try it this way. So I'm gonna call this once and not care about it. I'm gonna print out, um, let's call this promise. All 
I'm not sure if this will work. I just want to quickly try it. If it doesn't work, then we will just not there. So the first promise should complete by the time the second uh, by the second uh, promise completing. Okay, so we got our result here. I guess it doesn't show the status, but it shows that the promise um, has a some value, so it's not pending. I think there's a way to see the status though. Um, I don't think it's too important, but let me quickly Google it. Get status of promise JavaScript. My internet wants to be slow today or not come back at all. All right, I think uh, that's as long as we don't really care about this. So there is a way to view the pro uh, status of the promise at a given time, but since my internet doesn't seem to be working, I will forget it. Can you guys still hear me? Yep, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm not sure why my browser is out to lunch, but we are approaching lunch time. So, okay, so that should complete our promise discussion. Uh, next up, we're going to do HTTP review. How are we doing on time? So we're at 45. I think we should be able to complete this. Again, this is going to be a review. So hopefully these aren't new concepts. Um, but let's kind of power through our HTTP review before lunchtime. So here, uh, we're going to talk about HTTP. What does HTTP stand for? It stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This is how you communicate over the web. So you make HTTP requests when you're going to a web page, for example. And then some server on the back end will send you an HTTP response. Usually it'll be like a web page you requested. So in this case, uh, I was trying to get to some page. It's not coming up. Can I get to, I don't know, yahoo.com? All right. Oh, there we go. So I made a request. This was an HTTP request, a get request made to yahoo.com. Whatever server is processing that gave me back a web page. So that's why my browser got a web page and it rented it. Here I got a server not found. I'm not sure if Google's down. That'd be kind of unexpected, but in this case, um, yeah. So I sent a request. I got a HTTP response back, and that response was an HTML page that my browser rendered. Um, okay. So what is HTTP used for? Again, we've covered this before. It's a standard protocol for communication over the web, um, usually between a client and server. Your web browser would be a client, and there would be our server processing uh, requests on the back end. So client, such as web browser, sends an HTTP request and it processes a re response. So it sends out a request, gets a response. Uh, the opposite would be servers, like web server. They, you know, they receive requests from clients and they will process it and then send back an HTTP response. Um, since it's plain text, so it's human, human readable format. Um, I think we've talked about the format before, uh, I think during our HTML week, but just to kind of go over it again, HTTP requests, um, you can have different methods. So we talked about get, get requests, post requests. We've used, you know, during our Django days when we we're submitting forms, um, usually we submit them as post methods. But also keep in mind, you use puts and deletes. Um, this is kind of standard way to update data. You know, I know with Django, we always use post, um, but you can use put. And I think that's the proper way to actually update data is by sending a put request to the server saying, hey, I want to update a piece of data on your uh, on the server side. Likewise, there's a delete method that we can send to um, via an HTTP request, and that's asking to remove some data from a server. All right, so these are some methods. There are more methods out there, but these are probably the four most common ones you'll see. Get being the most common, because that's, you know, whenever you go to a web page, you're making get requests or your browser thing get requests for you. Um, the format, uh, we talked about this before. It's not too important to memorize the format, but usually top line will have. Um, your request. In this case, a get request. I'm going to donuts.html. Um, the protocol version, so in this case, 1.1. We have some header files. So in this case, let's say I'm going to platoon donutshop.com. You, you might have a you know, user agent will be your browser. Again, there's a whole list of headers that might be included. I'm not going to go through them all here. You guys can Google them if you're interested. Then you need a mandatory blank line. Again, this is just part of the formatting. So there'll be a blank line. And then you might have an optional message body. For get requests, you almost never have a message body. You just make a request, and that's all the data that the get request needs to know about. Um, posts, on the other hand, usually has more data associated with it. So post requests, you have the method where you're trying to send it to. Let's say I'm trying to place an order 
on, you know, on this website. I'd probably post it to order.html if that's their, you know, landing page. Um, and platoon donut shop, yada, yada. And then I might have some data I'm sending along with my order. For example, let's say I want to buy a chocolate donut and it costs 350. You know, that'll be passed along to the server so the server can process it and say, all right, we're going to charge you 350. Um, we'll send you a chocolate donut or, you know, someone will bring you a chocolate donut. So again, this is a post method because we're changing data on the, on the server side. So in this case, we're probably creating an order that's going to be stored um, in some database somewhere. All right, so then we get into HTTP response format, uh, has a status line. So we're going to get some status. Again, there are codes associated with each status. Anything in the 200 range means, you know, good. 300 means redirect, I think. 400 means uh, client error. And then 500 means server error or something like that. So in this case, you'll see something like a header. Um, you have a content type telling you what response kind of contains. So in this case, we're going to expect an HTML uh, format back. Uh, we get an empty line, and then we'll get our body. So in this case, if we you know, got a response back, it might be an HTML page that says, enjoy your donuts in a proper HTML document. Okay, and then we talked about response codes. I, I believe Tom covered this during the HTML week, but again, just to re refresh, um, anything in the 100 range is just information, like, hey, we're processing your message. Anything in the 200 means, all right, successful request. So if I try to go to a page, I'll get a 200 response back or some something in the 200 range. Um, if I'm redirected, I'll get a 300 code, 404. We've seen that probably, that's probably the most famous 400 error um, where you go to a page that doesn't exist. Like if I try that in my browser, uh, where'd my browser go? So I try to go to some page like made up page. Um, I got error 404. I guess you can't quite see it. So they just redirect you to the homepage, but I got a error 404 listed up here. So they're sending back a response with some data saying, hey, you got an error. Um, but other, other websites might implement it differently. Like a lot of sites will have a 404 page saying, hey, you can find it. I think GitHub does that. So if I go to GitHub and try to go to some made up repository. So let's go to hangman made up. Now let's get a 404. So again, the server got a 404. It sent back some page saying, hey, couldn't find what you're looking for. All right, so those are status codes. Again, you can search the web for different types of status, status codes that you want to learn about, but just be, understand that anything in a 200 range means okay. Okay, so I think that covers our HTTP review. Again, um, hopefully a lot of this was um, something that we talked about earlier. Any questions on HTTP? Um, again, don't need to memorize this formatting. Don't worry about it. I think the main takeaway, just understand the methods that we talked about. So make sure you understand when you set a get, a get request versus when you send a post request or a put or delete, just the use cases. So get is when you're going to a web page. Post is when you're submitting data to a web server. So usually when you're filling out a form online, like let's say you're signing up for a new web page um, or creating a new login, you will send a post request like, hey, this is my username, this is my password, um, do something with it. All right, with that, any questions on HTTP stuff or even going back to JavaScript promises? Again, promises, not easy at all. Hopefully they made sense, at least on a basic level, and you guys will kind of understand them as we talk about the Fetch API. What questions do you guys have? Feel like I might have putting putting the class to sleep there with my lecture. Um, so no, it's good. Three. It's a it's a lot. I'm just gonna I'm gonna rewatch it too just to make sure I'm digesting it. Yep. Yeah, um, a lot. Definitely worth reading some other documentations on promises. Uh, our curriculum page again has our examples. So if you want to kind of go through that as we went through on lecture, you can see the coding examples. Kind of just understand um, asynchronous code and then understand promises. Um, kind of how they're structured. Again, the structure is probably one of the hardest parts to kind of understand. It took my mind a while to kind of accept that, all right, I understand we're passing in some callbacks. Um, we're creating a new object, callbacks will be called, and then we handle uh, whatever's passed back. It, it, again, it's a lot. Promises are just, yeah, they might cause you headaches, unfortunately. Um, it's just part of the game of 
dealing with web development and JavaScript. Is, no is there a preference oh. between? Go. Sorry, Jeff. It's all good, man. Um, is, is there a prep preference between using uh, async await versus like promise in terms of like it's just kind of what, what whatever fits? Is it is it like legacy is async, modern is promise, or? Uh, yeah, I know async await is newer. Um, I'm not sure what version of JavaScript introduced it, so it is, it is probably newer than the dot then construct. Um, in terms of preference, I think it's up to you. Most modern browsers should be able to handle either um, either structure for your JavaScript. Um, I can say, again, with our example for serial, the one caveat is with async functions. Again, you need to, um, you always return a promise. So eventually you're going to do a dot then if you need to process the result. Um, so dot then can be just used outside of an async function. So that might be a preference to use it if you don't want to create you know, async function manually. But I like the syntax here. Again, just reading it visually. This makes more sense to me than reading dot then chain together. This makes sense. This is going to complete fully, and then this happens. Like that makes that's basically synchronous code the way it's written here. Result will get you the actual result, and we'll use that on our next line. So here, I prefer async await, but I'm going to say, as far as I know, there's no one preferred methodology. So I'm going to say use what you are comfortable with. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else knows better. If they if there is a preference, again, I might be incorrect on that. But um, yeah, use which one you're most comfortable with. Um, just kind of understand both. When you're reading code. Okay. Um, any other questions? Again, I know it's a lot of material, so I'm not gonna not gonna pretend it's you know you guys will get it right away. But again, promises will make more sense. Fingers crossed when we talk about the fetch API after lunch. So that's where that's why we're interested in promises because the fetch API returns you a promise, and you gotta know how to consume that promise. Um, but uh, with that. Um, I'm going to say if there's no further questions, let me stop the recording here.